Well, hello and welcome to our broadcast. Uh, I'm your host, Syl Tripeny, Senior Vice President and System Chief Nursing Officer at Providence. As a reminder, the information provided this uh, during this event is for information purposes only. If you have any medical questions, please reach out to your primary care or healthcare professional. So joining me during this live event is Chris Martano, a critical care nurse from Alaska, and Marie Narak, a hospital at home nurse from Washington State. Chris, Marie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Thanks for joining me. Uh, it's a beautiful day in uh, in Washington State. Uh, gr really great to be spending some time with uh, with two practicing uh, practicing nurses. And we don't have a lot of time, so let's dive right into it. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Marie. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, why you chose to be a nurse, and and what do you do today exactly? Um, so I've been a nurse for a little over twenty years, 20 plus years, and I started out in a surgical trauma ICU. I've been an ICU nurse um, most of that, all of that time until um, a year ago when I joined the telehealth team for the Providence Hospital at home. And um, I've gone from bedside nursing, I've dipped my toes into home health and infusion therapy. So I've kind of kind of been um, in different avenues of nursing besides ICU, but most of my nursing life has been in the critical mm -hmm. care units. And um, I also um, worked as an assistant manager or clinical nurse supervisor at Swedish First Hill in the ICUs there for six plus years and um, wanted a change and and uh, found telehealth and and here I am. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing with us, uh, Chris. If I remember correctly, you were in the Marine. You decided to go into nursing. So tell us a little bit about why you decided to go into nursing and what do you do exactly today? Well, I was uh, once a long time ago. I was a Marine infantryman, and the Navy supplies us our our medical corpsmen, um, and they're fantastic, fantastic individuals, and they inspired me to become a nurse. So. When I got out, the first thing I did, I went to nursing school, graduated in 2013. I've been an ICU nurse ever since. Um, I, I really fell in love with open heart nursing. Um, and I've been doing that up until I came to Anchorage. And, we, and up here we have the ICU, which is a blended unit. Mm -hmm. And we, ha we take everything, neuro, trauma, cardiac, medical. And so you really have to learn a lot really quickly and on the telemetry side is where I'm at now in the EICU is what we call it. And we're just, we monitor and we support nurses, um, especially during the day. And then at night we have a physician who will monitor multiple sites across 16 different critical care sites over six different states. Um, and so that's what I'm a part of now. And I, I really love it. Awesome. Awesome. You know, Marie, you you practice in a typical you know hospital environment. You're transitioning now into a, a remote virtual setting. So, is it what you expected? Do you miss anything from the prior setting? You know, would would you like best about offering virtual care? Just give us a little bit of insight into that. Yeah. Um, so when I went from um, in person working on the unit and um, I'm working with patients, very different going into the virtual world. I had no idea what I was really getting into. Um, I just knew that um, telehealth was, you know, where I feel like healthcare was moving towards. And so I thought that would be really interesting to, to kind of dip my toes into that. And so um, it, it does take some getting used to you know, to go from being an inpatient or in-person nurse, um, working with patients and being hands-on to doing everything remotely and vir or virtually. So, you know, um, just making sure having those good, good communication, having those good conversations with the patients and with our col my colleagues, it's really important to, to be able to um, have that relationship to be able to Mm -hmm. to work well. So you're highlighting, <clears throat> you're highlighting communication. 
So if you if we have nurses out there who are thinking about going into uh, um, you know virtual care, uh, or maybe there they, they could even be you know uh, nursing students right now that might be you know listening to us and thinking hmm, you know gee I I, I might want to do that. Other than communication, how can one best prepare themselves to practice in that, that environment? Is there anything that comes to mind? The first, <laughs> the top thing that comes to mind for me is, is the the tech, like making sure all of your <laughs> your computer, your connection, you know, everything is in working order because there are numerous tech issues that can occur, you know, um, when you're working remotely or virtually. So really knowing that that is going to be working so that you can do your job, you know, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But just knowing that, um, you know, communication is a big, is a big thing, you know, with your colleagues, with the physicians, with the patients, mm -hmm. you know, um, when you're in person working with patients, you can put your eyes on the patients, you can put your hands on the patients. But when you're working virtually, you really have to have, um, you know, good descriptors of what's going on with them. And, um, you know, just, just having really good experience behind you, you know, as far as assessment skills and things I think would be, would be one yeah. of the, yeah, it's a different level of assessment, right? So it's mm -hmm. showing a lot of curiosity, knowing to know which question to ask and where right. to probe. I can uh, I can certainly appreciate that. Hey, Chris, last time we chatted, uh, so you were sharing with us that your wife is very much pregnant. In fact, you know, like, aren't you like expecting any time now? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and that's your second child, right? Yes, we're having a little boy. Wow. So, uh, so, okay. So a toddler and right. Yeah. I, I, I envision, so you're working from home now you have this toddler, you know, roaming around and, uh, you know, you're, you, you might be in a conversation with your, uh, you know, with your child or your child is having a conversation with you or is bugging you about something. <laughs> you're walking into the other room, uh, and poof, like you're on stage. <laughs> uh, offering really serious guidance and caring for like six pe sick people virtually. Mm -hmm. How do you manage this transition? How, how, how can one best prepare or well, best prepare for it? And uh, any tips uh, to anyone out there on how to best show up uh, in, you know, in, in an environment like that? Yeah, it's chaos. Um, no, it's not bad at all. I, I think what it is, the main tip is having your spouse uh, you and your spouse are become a really good team, obviously. So uh, when I need to work, she's managing everything else. Um, and it's a it's a huge time saver as well. Working from home after being a bedside nurse forever, it, it definitely takes some getting used to and having that IT guy on speed dial is important. <laughs> um, but when it comes to working from home, it's it's awesome. I love it. I, I don't have to do the hour drive into Anchorage because I live out in the valley. So I've saved myself two hours there that I have with my family. And so nurses who are planning on maybe heading towards technological, the telemetry and uh, working from home side, um, there are some benefits to it. And again, it is it can be a little chaotic. And so you need to have a really good support system at home that can mm -hmm. provide that support for you. And I don't have to cook my lunches or anything. That's already provided for me here. Um, <laughs> I'm extremely comfortable. I can I can get in my lounge chair if I need to and set everything up. All I need is a laptop and a headset, and I can do my job. And I can help, uh, you know, That's cool. 50, 60 patients at a time. It's interesting. So, so some folks that might be on the call may not know exactly what it means when you say doing telemetry. So can you just give a little bit more detail of what that means? I, I think it's it's just working remotely. Um, okay. And so we have a camera system. I think they changed the name to Teladoc. Okay. And so we can camera into every single room. So the hardware is already set up in every single room. Okay. And they're also, they have a couple of carts with cameras on them. And so we just, we tune in, they can see my face. I can see them. I can zoom in all the way to, to see their eyelashes. Like we have that type of capability where we can see everything. They can hear me perfectly. And I have all the same charting system, all the same information they have access to. Um, and then they just can utilize me and use, utilize my expertise as needed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool, cool. 
You think telehealth is here to stay, grow? Um, I think it's the future. I think the future is already here. Uh, if we look at our smartphones, all the apps we have on there, we have social media, but really the medical side is just now tapping into it. And the more connected we are, the more information we have. I think physicians in particular, especially at night, we have one doctor that is on for all of these patients. You know, they have multiple doctors at each site doing what they're doing during the day, caring for the patients. And then you have one doctor at night caring for everybody. I think that's phenomenal that you could have that type of capability, just the cost savings, as I can imagine, just having one person that can handle every single emergency across six different states, over 16 different sites. I mean, if that's not the future, if that's not where we're heading, uh, it's just going to yeah. get better, yeah. I think, yeah. in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. It, Marie, what, what type of patients, you know, hospital at home is, a, it, I mean, it's, it's fairly new. Um, mm -hmm. Not, not every healthcare system actually offers that. It's yeah. not home health. It's hospital no. at home. Correct. Can you help us understand a little bit, you know, so what is the difference? What type of patients do you see mm -hmm. in, in a hospital at home? So they are acute care um, patients. And what I mean by that is they're not patients that would be in an intensive care setting. Okay. And um, tip, we, we would see any um, patient that needs, that continues to need um, you know, a um, acute care level needs. So, you know, we typically will take those patients that are in maybe their last week of being in the hospital, um, pers like patients that are still trying to finish out antibiotic therapy, um, patients that are being, um, that were admitted for congestive heart failure that are still getting, you know, extra fluid off, um, you know, so that they're able to breathe better and move around and have more activity. Um, so so just, a, just a whole gamut of, of patient diagnoses that we are able to take. And so hospital at home uh, versus home health. Home health is typically an outpatient. So once they've discharged from the hospital, you know, they're set up with um, nursing, um, nurses' aides, um, occupational therapy or physical therapy um, versus hospital at home, those patients are still considered inpatient um, patients and they're just transferred even though they're going home. And it is it is really new. So we do um, continually explain to the patients and their families, you know, what the program is and, and what the expectation and role from us and from them are. So, um we do have field nurses and um, I'm one of the command center nurses. So I um, am behind the scenes, but I, I also see the patients virtually. We camera in, the patients have tablets they go home with and all the peripherals, blood pressure cuff, thermometer, um, oximeter that um, will measure their oxygen levels. And so um, the field nurses, we partner up with them and there are, are they do, there are eyes and their hands on with us. And we usually will um, video in with them to do the assessment and to um, link the doctor up so that they can video in with patient and do their, um, their visit with the patient. So it's just, it's basically just like if we were in person on the unit, you know, when the doctors are rounding, the nurses usually will go in with the doctors and it's, it's, you know, pretty much the same. And there's, that's the big difference. So let, me, let me make sure that I got this right. So essentially you're telling, so you're, you tell me as a patient, for instance, if all of a sudden I need the criteria to be hospital. At home, it's like still you're still going to be hospitalized. The difference is instead of spending time in this hospital bed, you're going to be spending time in your bed at home, and we're going to be checking it up on you. In fact, we'll constantly monitor you, but we're going to do that virtually. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, are there times when you also send people to my home? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. You will see. Um, we have the capability to have portable chest X-rays, um, EKGs, um, ultrasounds, um, anything like um, CAT scans or MRIs, we would transfer back to the facility to have that procedure, and then they would go back home. Um, 
occupational therapy, physical therapy, and then the field nurses, of course, go out to do the hands-on. And um, all of our equipment is virtual, so even the steth stethoscope, we have a program that the nurse can listen to heart and lung sounds. And all of us, uh, the command center nurse and the physician, we can listen to those heart and lung sounds virtually um, when they're doing those hands-on assessments. Feels like a great environment for students for students to learn into as well. Do you guys have any students today? We don't at this time. Do you see that? Do you see that in the future? I, I could see that. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And and we're just growing. Um, it's been about a, a year since I came on. Uh, I started in April last year, and then we actually uh, went live in July of last year. So. Um, I think we're up to 50 patients now, which is great, and we're um, just growing. We're going to be getting a new facility uh, probably in July. So That's pretty cool. So you, oh, so you guys don't work from home. You work from a centralized hub. We work from home. We're all remote. Okay. We're not all in Washington, and so okay. we have some nurses that, uh, command center nurses that are in Texas, in Oregon, and then the rest of us are in Washington. Okay, that's yeah. pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. Chris, do you guys do you guys uh, have any students in your uh, in in your environment? No, it's a, it requires too much clinical experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really hard to even get enough um, experienced nurses because you got to know every machine, the balloon pumps. I mean, you've got to have you got to be able to know how to do it all because you might have a nurse that has a really sick patient on multiple different machines and I have to be able to help them with that. So got it's it. hard to get a, uh, it, I wouldn't even know if having a nursing yeah. program would help with their learning yeah. on that be too much, I think. So maybe not necessarily by your side, but you might be able to though support a nursing student that's in the environment oh, yeah. with the other nurse. Uh, I could see that, you know, happening. Right? Oh yeah. I get lots of calls from nurses in remote sites that get some weird thing they've never seen before, um, a weird drip, and they just call me to ask for help. Like, hey, does this sound right? Does it seem safe for the patient? Do you think we're even capable of even watching this patient? And so, yeah, it, 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 we're definitely a resource for anybody that wants to utilize our knowledge and clinical experience, I think. Well, that's pretty cool. <clears throat> that's pretty cool. Both of you have practiced, you know, long enough uh, as nurses to, um, you know, my my assumption is you've seen, you know, a multiple multiple things in, in multiple settings, and uh, you know, we've all had that moment in our career as a nurse that just sticks with us. It's whether it's the situation, whether it's that patient, whether it's that family member, uh, that special moment that really it just sticks with us our entire career. I wonder what that moment was for you. Uh, Any one of you want to share what that what that might be? <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything on the off the top of my head other than what happened recently, okay. um, which kind of explains what EICU is. Okay. So out in, out in Dutch Harbor up here in Alaska on the Aleutian chain out by the Bering Sea, we have a little fishing village out there and they have a little clinic and we help support them. They have a one bed there that we can camera in and help. And usually they call me and just check on the camera, but no, they had a real patient this time. It was a super sick, critically ill one. Um, and they don't have a pharmacy. They're you know, they have the doctor there and they're intubating the patient, but they had to run multiple drips. Um, and so they were asking for my help. They're asking me how to mix drugs. And I'm like, we have a pharmacist. I don't mix drugs. So I had to figure out how to do that, help them with that. Um, yeah. And get the resources they needed. And I was on that line with them for in the camera, in the room with them for two hours until they were able to get transport to get them out of there and get them up to Providence and Anchorage. So, yeah. um, it, it kind of puts you on the spot, but really, like I said before, our, our, our ICU is blended. We have the most experienced nurses in Alaska up here in Providence in our ICU, and I'm one of them, and they're asking for my help. And I realize at that moment, I'm probably the best help they have at that moment. Um, 
And it's wonderful to be that type of a resource and to use my clinical knowledge and experience to help that patient get the best care possible in that in that situation. So, yeah, no kidding. And imagine, I mean, I, I, I so imagine the impact that you've actually had uh, on that team. Uh, I mean, if you hadn't been there, how where else would they have gotten their information? And, um, you know, I wonder what, you know, what could have happened to that patient? It's it's nice to have that reassur reassurance. Somebody that's seen that every day. We see it every day. They see it maybe once a year, if that. They they rarely ever get a critical ill patient. I see it every day. I know what our doctors do. I can get the right doctor on the line with their physician to verify that they're doing everything properly and safe. Yeah, it's it's. A, I think the EIC is a great resource mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful place to work. If anybody yeah. was even is yeah, considering no that. Yeah. No kidding. And the ability to be able to to remote that to remote areas. I mean, this is like the perfect mm -hmm. example of, you know, care that may not would not have been available, uh, you know, otherwise that all of a sudden is accessible. So, you know, remote uh, areas, uh, communities and needs. Uh, so that's that's a really, really cool thing. Yeah. That's yeah. Pretty cool. Wow. Marie, any any thoughts about that? Moments in your career. Yeah, I have, I have, I have a few, um, but I'll I'll speak to the telehealth piece. Okay. Um, yeah, um, so I know when um, when I started last year, you know the pandemic was still at its height, and so we had uh, we also helped while we were getting started with our hospital at home program, with the home monitoring, and um, we had anywhere from 150 up to almost 500 patients that we were helping to monitor 24 seven. And um, I will say, I was really surprised, you know, uh, at, the, at the support that we were being those patients and how appreciative of our support that they were. You know, they were um, quarantined some of them didn't have anyone to speak with um, or bounce even just simple ideas off of. And they just just knowing that we we were able to talk with them and talk them through just the simplest things that they, you know, had questions about and, and helping them through that. And then um, on the hospital at home side, just how, you know, the patients also go into being transferred into the program, think, not knowing exactly what the program entails. And then when they figure out they get to go home and sleep in their own bed, you know, and, and uh, be able to recover for the rest of hospital stay at home, you know, in the comfortable place that you can probably recover in, you know, they're really, they're really appreciative of that. And, you know, just amazed at um how how we're able to continue to give them that hospital level care you know in their own homes so that's, that's really cool. been that's great cool for me. yeah you know what you two just reminded me of i i just recently read uh read an article uh in, in, in actually it's in harvard business review there's there's this author which is you know fairly well known author his name is marcus buckingham and he wrote an article about a, a, a book, uh, but the article was based on the on the book. It's yeah. love plus work. Why am I talking about this right now? I'm talking about this because here's what I'm hearing from both of you. I am hearing pieces of stuff that you love to do. It just comes out. You know, you could you could just you could just hear it. And when people do what they love. Um, you know, magic, you know, magic, magic happens, you know, being a nurse uh, is, uh, can be, uh, I, I, I believe uh, is one of the most rewarding, you know, profession that we can, uh, that we can do uh, out there. And I, I really appreciate both of you, uh, you know, showing up and, and doing it in a non-traditional way, right? If we can even call virtual non-traditional anymore, uh, that's probably, to Chris's point, that's actually the future. Uh, that nomenclature <laughs> is that it, the non-traditional might be in the uh, in, in acute care in a few years. Uh, in a few years from now, <laughs> if if the two of you were sitting in front of nursing students or aspiring nursing students or people who might consider going into nursing uh, as a uh, as a profession, 
what um, what advice might you have to share with them? And uh, uh, yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. What advice might you have to share with them? For me personally, I think being a good nurse is both having compassion and competence. So yes, when you're a new nurse, you're going to come in and you're going to learn to be competent. Um, but if you don't have that compassion piece, you're just not going to be an effective nurse. Or you can be extremely compassionate, but if you're not competent at your job, you're not working on those skills, um, you're just not going to be a great nurse. And if the goal is to be provide the greatest patient safety and patient care, be the best nurse you can be at those two. Those two are factors. Yeah, so honing on your skills and uh, make sure that you show up with compassion mm -hmm. in everything uh, in everything that you do. That's really, really great advice. You will anything be, else to add? What you, was that? You will be challenged on the compassion side, for sure. <laughs> yeah, you will. yeah, yeah, it's good. You know? <clears throat> humans are humans. Uh, right. That's for yeah. sure. Marie, anything else to add to that? Yeah, no, I just think um, if... You know, I were talking with nursing students, you know, coming into nursing, you know, not knowing it, what, um, what p part of nursing they want to go into, critical care, acute care, telehealth, you know, just to keep an open mind. Um, you know, I can't, I, I totally agree with what Chris said about the compassion and being competent, because that is huge. Um, but just knowing, knowing what you're really going to be getting, you know, what career you're going to be getting into as far as nursing, because like you said, you're working with humans. We're all humans. You know, there's going to be those good days and there's bad days and it's not what you see on TV, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's definitely, you know, knowing that you have both of those being competent and being compassionate, I think is, is Chris was spot on with that. Yeah. We have to keep it real. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, so I pre appreciate you calling out. It may not necessarily be what you're, what you're seeing on TV. Uh, so, so it has its moments, you know, right? Moments of uh, joy, more moments where it, uh, where it fills our cup. Uh, you know, the example that, uh, you know, that you both shared, uh, on, you know, where, where, you know, you're making such an impact and a difference in the life of others. And that, I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. And not every profession has the opportunity to say that, you know, it's, uh, and we're very fortunate we think, uh, voted uh, as the number one trusted profession uh, in this country. Far pacing all other all other disciplines. Uh, there's a reason for that. I happen to believe that it's primarily because we're there. We are present uh, uh, every time, always. Uh, in fact, uh, in every you know setting, uh, you know. Most disciplines will come in and out, uh, but we're there uh, s sticking around with the patient for the entire time. So uh, that's likely one of the reasons why, uh, why it's voted the most trusted profession. I can't thank you both enough for, uh, for joining me uh, today. This half hour has just like come and gone mm -hmm. in a split uh, second. So Marie, Chris, thanks for joining us. Thank you. To everyone out there, thanks for listening and sending in your questions. To learn more about our initiatives, our programs, our services, our ways to give, uh, or if you're looking to help, uh, for some help uh, or medical advice, uh, please visit 